don't get me started on Narnia. I could talk forever. Also, I did look it up. I uh, went ahead and pulled my Narnian Companion, and I was right and also wrong. Um, I was in the right age range for them. Um, in Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when they first go to Narnia, uh, Lucy is eight, like I remembered. I was like, yeah, she's eight. But um, the age is staggered more than I thought. I thought they were in like two, then a stagger, and then the other two. But it was actually all along. So we have In Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, um, Lucy was eight, Ed was ten, uh, Susan, Susan was 12 and Peter was 13. So Susan and Peter were right next to each other, 12 and 13. Um, and Ed and Lucy were two years un under that. And then Lucy was two years under Ed. So Edmund was 10 and Lucy was eight when they first went into Narnia. So I do stand by what I say, um, overall that uh, particularly Susan and Peter were a little old. So when they went to Narnia, um, you know, they were 12 and 13. So they definitely had more than just the childhood impressions. So like when you're a kid and, and you start learning, oh, Google YouTube videos, search YouTube videos for, um, anything about babies brain development in in the womb and um, immediately after. It's fascinating, guys. Our brains are crazy. And how we've developed as a species to... It's nuts. It's nuts, guys. Like, early infancy and early childhood, your brain is doing ridiculously magical things. It's, it's nuts. It's crazy. Um, so anyway, uh, in your early infancy, in your childhood, uh, up through, you know, some of your initial education, you know, in kindergarten, elementary school age, um, <clears throat> yeah, I love the idea of this tree being here, but I'm not a fan of how it works in execution. I love the roots of this tree and it's adorable and twee but I can't get the adorable and twee tree to sit properly on either the nightstand or the mantelpiece. So unfortunately, the twee tree has got to go. So we are going to use this one over here. Okay, so anyway, baby's brains, early development, childhood. Um, what you're learning in, in that time of your life is largely focused on just survival, practical skills, um, the sorts of things that help you get along with your society in, in just the most basic ways. You learn the language, you learn tone and inflection, you start gathering impressions of faces. What does it look like when your mommy smiles at you? What does happy look like? What does laughter look like? how to mimic in your face and your body language those sorts of very basic expressions and modes. You know, that's the basis for what becomes your social conditioning and, and your ability as a member of society to interact and communicate effectively. Um, but the basis is laid in childhood. So you learn basic things like language and um, yeah, this room is done. I mean, obviously there's decoration and rugs and stuff, but this room is done. So I really think I'm not going to make any, any major changes. I think this floor is done. We've got the bulk of the main furniture and, oh, I haven't done curtains. Oh, I did. I did do curtains. I slammed those out one day, I guess rock on. Got that done. So yeah, so I think this floor is done and we will go 
downstairs to the basement. Mm, downstairs to the basement and start working on this level. It's completely spooky. There's nothing in this level at all. Mm. Wars. Okay, so just to wrap up real quick, as best I can, um, by the time someone's eight years old, they've got a basic handle on the sorts of things that when you get amnesia, you don't forget, you know, or mostly, most amnesia cases, the things the things you forget are more detailed, more complex and intricate and personalized. But you don't necessarily forget how to walk, how to ride a bike, um, how to express yourself, whatever language or body language. You, you don't forget to breathe. You don't forget to write, how to write, how to read and write. I mean, only in severe certain types of amnesia do you lose those basic functions, those kindergarten, elementary school, you know, what it means when someone says, go stand in a line, uh, you know, let's have nap time. Uh, those basic concepts. You don't necessarily lose those things. So those are the things that when Lucy went to Narnia, she had. She had those things. And maybe because she was, as far as I interpret the books, she was pretty precocious. She was bright and imaginative and adaptive. So, you know, maybe, maybe Lucy had a little bit more, um, you know, the beginning of more complex knowledge. But usually you don't really get into that until your preteens, until after you've moved from an elementary or a primary school into more advanced, into moving on. Um, was a 10 year old, was Edmund exposed to that? Maybe, maybe he was beginning that. Um, but like I said, in yesterday's stream, Edmund came to Narnia and had just a crazy intense personal, uh, just very impactful experience um and it it had to have changed uh, his character the trajectory he was on for his life overall and and the man that he would eventually develop into so he really got changed by that in a particularly narnian way with deep magic and uh, a real personal important connection a direct connection with Aslan and um, and and that sort of stuff so he, he might have been on the upper edge of of childhood and starting to incorporate more advanced and nuanced understandings of society and norms and ethics and expectations for how you behave and what's appropriate for your age or not. Um, but Susan at 12 years old and Peter at 13 years old, these are both, these are both kids that are, um, especially in, in previous, um, I mean, it's still, I think technically modern. I mean, we call the 1900s modern, so um, not modern like 2020 today, but in like 1940s, 1950s in Western countries uh, like Britain, um, a lot was expected of teenagers. Uh, you were supposed to, as you got into your teenage years, you were kind of expected to be a miniature adult in many ways. You were really expected, girls were expected to be really settling down into mimicking their mothers or mirroring womanhood, a more developed sense of what's appropriate for a woman and not just a little girl. 
And um, Peter, you know, 13-year-old boy, he's the young man of the house. And in wartime, his father is gone, and he really was going to be socially looked on as the head of the household and the the man of the house and um in in a kind of nuanced way at that time maybe even a little responsible for his own mother um for her safety and for the safety of his siblings and um you know she's older than him she's his mom and obviously she's gonna hold the household together british women were amazing during world war ii like just amazing look up britain in world war ii these people kicked butt they really they kicked some ass and took some names um they survived the blitz they were in a very long and protracted naval blockade with germany they were freaking screwed on just about every level and if hitler had taken the british islands if if hitler had taken england and britain uh the war would have turned out very very differently and um and britain held britain held against him they held that island and that's amazing it's really amazing and uh definitely look into british intelligence during this time frame british intelligence was just you think james bond is cool and like a super spy or more modern uh jason bourne or any of that oh my god british intelligence during world war ii it will make you weep it will make you exult these people were amazing so that's the kind of world that Peter was beginning to live in as a 13 year old boy. He's in that kind of world. Susan, a 12 year old girl, she's right on his heels. And they were at the point developmentally and socially where they were internalizing social norms, expectations, um, understanding of interpersonal relationships, sex and sexuality. Um, they're, they're going to be, uh, they're going to be indoctrinated, um, or enculturated by their society to be a useful adult member of that society with all the little details and minutia, uh, that that entails that you don't normally think about. You just, take it on and then do it. You perform it throughout your life. So that's a huge difference. If you're, if you're 13 moving to a new country, or uh, if you're 13, here's a more direct analogy, um, although not literal, like moving to a new state or a new country. But if you're 13 and say, uh, your parents get divorced and you get a new step parent. It's different. You have some habits and expectations already that are kind of set and there's going to be tension and struggle as you figure out how to negotiate a new relationship with these, this different circumstance, this sudden new expectations and um so you're going to struggle with that but an eight-year-old will have some adapting and adjusting to do but might be more resilient in that sort of situation more easily make new friends and go with the flow um, easier to just accept what is and move on as an eight-year-old you don't have any power. You, you have no uh, agency or choice in a relationship, in in the world. You, you just are doing what you're told still. You know, 10 years old, a little of the same. But by the time you're 12 or 13, you're definitely beginning to make your own decisions and have some control over your own life. And so it's harder. It's harder to just accept and move on. Um, so my feeling is that when Lucy 
got to Narnia and it became obvious that they were staying for a while, that's Lucy's fundamental development time. She's eight years old. She, during her stay in the golden age, went from eight to, oh, I did the math before. It's 20 something. It's her early twenties, um, eight plus 15, do the math. But so that's the time span. That's the age that she was in the golden age. And so this is a girl who in Narnia, um, learned about sex and reproduction in Narnia and in Narnia, she learned what is ethics, what is moral, what makes a good character, what makes a good adult, a functioning adult in Narnia. So in Narnia, she went through puberty and in Narnia, she uh, got her first period and learned about what that means and how, um, how to position that in her life. You know, is that scary? Is that normal? Is that, um, is that taboo? Do we not talk about that? Or do we just have it and move on? Um, you know, do the guys talk about it? Do, you know, do people who are non-conforming in some way, um, are they allowed to talk about it and uh, get support and help? I mean, all these little nuances of what's understood in society or expected in society that no one really spells out. You know, no one really sits you down at a certain age and says, well, here's all the rules. I mean, you're just constantly navigating that kind of stuff. And Lucy did that in Narnia. You know, her brothers and sisters had begun to do that in England, in London, during a war. And so they grew up pretty quick, um, maybe quicker than usual. And, and then there was Lucy and even if she was precocious and already beginning to gather this sort of information, um, she would come of age mostly in Narnia and with the Narnian set of rules and expectations and morals. And well, I mean, I cannot state enough how different Narnia is from the world that we inhabit. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, there's magic, <laughs> you know, um, things in this world that we say are mythical, fabulous, or fantastic fairy tales. Those exist in a very literal way in Narnia, um, you know, Bacchus and um, the frenzy girls that party and follow him everywhere and um, you know the the gods of rivers and spirits of trees uh, you know all of these things just literally exist right there in Narnia and um, above and beyond that most of Narnians are um, animals, <laughs> you know, they, they have what we would consider human traits, w what we would consider things in our world that only humans seem to do. Um, and take that with a grain of salt, because that's another story for another day about what do animals do that for a long time we've thought only humans are capable of doing. But anyway, in Narnia, at least, animals are capable of everything. And there is a difference between uh, domesticated animals, wild animals, and Narnian animals. Animals that walk and talk and function and build houses and use sewing machines and, you know, that kind of stuff. You know what I'm talking about. Narnians. Um, and for the most part, Nar Narnians are um, non-humanoid animals, anthropomorphized animals. So, um, 
if you look at nature and if you're a kid, maybe you should ignore this part. Um, and if you're a parent, maybe you want to take the kid out of the room first and listen to this yourself and then decide if the kid can listen to this. That's your prerogative as a parent. I think everyone should hear this, but you know, I, I just, there you go, little warning. All right. If you look at the animal world, even in this world, not even in Narnia, but just in this world as biological, zoological facts, there is huge diversity. Um, not all species are sexually dimorphic. Uh, humans are sexually dimorphic. The um, egg bearers look different from the egg um, fertilizers in physical ways. Um, there's a range, you know, there's a range that overlaps, um, but we are a sexually dimorphic species. But not all species are. Not all species are sexually dimorphic. And some species are wildly more dimorphic than we are. The difference between the two is fabulously huge. Um, like, uh, I mean, peacocks. The difference between a male peacock and a female peacock is intense. Females look like overgrown sparrows or, you know, brown subdued chickens. And, and you know what a male peacock looks like. I mean, they're green and blue and glittery and they have those tails that are ridiculous. So, so yeah, crazy sexual dimorphism in, or, or none, in the animal kingdom. And, you know, how do you understand what that means? Who teaches you how to interpret that? In this world, um, lots of times that's the job of religion, to explain why, why, the why of things. We can see from science that it is a thing, but why? And the why in this world is often answered by religion or by some sort of morality system. Um, for example, why are men and women different? Because they were created differently um, or they came from different parts of creation. You know, maybe men were made with mud and women were made with um, grain. I don't know, I'm, I'm pulling this up. So, you know, so, so that's something, you know, what in Narnia explained the why of sexual dimorphism? You know, so what did Lucy learn from animals about whether or not that's important, whether or not it matters if you're dimorphic or not, and what that means, why, what is that? So, you know, animals were teaching her these things. And, um, and, and that's not the only thing. In our world, biologically, zoologically, um, sexuality is plentiful and varied. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not sure how else to describe that in a tame YouTube kind of way but uh, very much in the animal kingdom, we see both sex for function, reproductive, or, and sex for pleasure, just, just cause it feels good um, in, in a non-reproductive way. We see both um, sex in both ways, reproductive and pleasurable, um, demonstrated by heterosexual pairings, mating pairings, and also homosexual pairings, non-mating pairings, pairings that are just, hey, we're gay and we think this feels good or, you know, and so there's a question too. What does gay mean? What is that? Why? What does that mean? How do you interpret that? How do you 
place that in your understanding of ethics and purpose and function. And in this world, that's informed, again, very religiously. Understanding why something is, uh, is very different for us than understanding that it is. It, it just simply is. So again, here's Lucy and um, she is in Narnia where the people, the adults and mentors responsible for informing this understanding, this way of interpreting, are animals, fawns, and dryads. Do you know how dryads reproduce? It's generally held that a dryad pollinates and reproduces then with whoever her pollen falls on. I mean, like, they're trees. You know how trees reproduce. It's all pollen and nuts <laughs> and fruits and berries and craziness, right? So that's an adult explaining to Lucy, um, you know, how to function as a sexually active adult. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, we have um, a couple really famous examples of, I think the first ones that got really talked about in popular culture were penguins, gay penguins. Um, who foster eggs together and build nests together and have lifelong or at least season-long pair bonding. And, you know, so imagine a penguin trying to explain to Lucy, there comes a time when a penguin might like another penguin and they hang out together and build a nest together and um, they adopt an egg and raise it as their own child and that's a thing that they do um and that's totally normal they were just made that way and that's how they do and um and then there's lucy like eight years old going oh okay <laughs> okay all right you know and so for me i interpret lucy as a socially, morally, and culturally adaptive Narnian. Her brothers and sisters, especially Peter and Susan, are Narnians. They lived there and they were part of the Golden Age and um, they were kings and queens appointed by Aslan and all that stuff. And um, so they're Narnians, but <clears throat> They're Narnians who would have been applying their understanding of British norms and British uh, morals and maybe Anglican norms and morals and ethics and, um, you know, maybe an Anglican understanding of not just what exists, but why it exists. And Lucy would not have that. She would not have that. She was, she was on the cusp. She was close, but she just wasn't old enough to have fully incorporated and fully indoctrinated, not in a bad way, but just in a natural, this happens to everyone way. But she, she wouldn't have soaked it all in yet. Um, she had just barely begun that level of soaking it in. And so the rest of it was all Narnian in influence. You know, animals and figures of myth and, and magic got to explain to her how to be an adult and what is normal and what is healthy and what to accept in life as natural and God-given, Aslan-given uh, versus you know, what is not okay. A wolf is okay. A wolf that tracks down and eats its prey is okay. That's normal. That's what a wolf does. A werewolf uh, that doesn't just track down prey to eat, but tracks down prey to be harmful and cruel, that's not normal. 
that's not ethical, that's not good. And that's something Lucy never would have learned in 1940s, 1950s England. <laughs> like, of course not. Um, so, so there's, I mean, there's that. That, in its, in its essence, that's something I think people who read and talk about and write about Narnia and the Chronicles of Narnia, um, that I think is something that's often very overlooked um, and, and not fully explored or recognized. Um, sometimes people write about Lucy after Narnia as being particularly religious. Um, even more so than her siblings, or pr particularly spiritual, even more than her siblings, which is fine. I can see that. I can get that. Um, but not a lot of them, and people talk about the age, how they were adults, and then they magically just zapped back to being, you know, she went from a 20-something to an eight-year-old again. And so you see people writing and talking about what that experience would be like, that tension, that frustration, the unfairness of it. I mean, who wants to go through puberty two times, right? That's terrible, it's a bad idea. But Lucy did it, and, um, and probably Susan too. I mean, 12 is not too young now, but we have also been seeing age of onset of, of having a period uh, earlier and earlier, younger and younger as time goes on. Um, so I don't know, mid to late 1940s British girl, you'd have to Google when, when they were seeing onset of, of periods and womanhood coming of age. So maybe Susan had to go through it twice as well. And that's just awful. <laughs> that's um, Although the second time might be a little easier because you know what to expect. <laughs> and you've, you know, you've had to deal with it for any number of years in Narnia. So, you know, even for the guys going through puberty, you would maybe, hopefully it would be a little easier. Um, if not super frustrating because you're, having to do it around people who don't understand that you've already done it once and should be treated like an adult and a capable functioning equal. Um, so yeah, so we hear about that kind of frustration, but for me, uh, personally, I like to take it one step further and I like to think about and explore the ways in which Lucy's understanding of biology her understanding of morals, her understanding of why, why things are the way they are. Um, those things and, and sexuality, norms and ethics of sexual conduct and mating and reproduction, those things are all Narnian informed for her. And even after she gets back to England, that's some ingrained base level core stuff that's core to what a person is in the world and how their character is shaped and um what they will fight for what what will a person see as an injustice um and 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 try to go to bat for and fight for or protect versus what people see as a problem a problem that is threatening society or stability um, or their understanding of what makes a family, what makes a household, what makes a functioning, stable, healthy adult. So I'd like to see more of that. I'd like to see people tangle with that. I would like to see people acknowledge that and um, come up with their own thoughts and theories and conclusions about how that would shape Lucy and how that would influence both during her time in Narnia in the Golden Age and her time back in England, um, back as an eight-year-old having to grow up again and 
you know, what would she struggle with? What would be odd or weird to her about human society um, now that she has some other perspective? What would she think? Well, that's just utterly arbitrary and stupid. I mean, um, 1950s gender disparity would probably tick her off pretty bad. You know, she's, she's from a land where a lion is king and it's the lionesses in a pack and a pride of lions that do the hunting and the working and going out and getting resources and bringing them back. It's the women. And, um, you know, so when she gets back to 1950s Britain and is told, we're only just now letting women explore having careers. You know, never mind that we've had queens. Uh, that's really a man's job. And so there are expectations of what women will and won't do. And I, I can imagine Lucy just losing her mind over that. Just like, why? Why? That's ridiculous. That's arbitrary. So um, for me, I push it further. Um, as you can probably see by the pride flags I have on the wall in Lucy's room, uh, I do think if only because we see it as a biological, zoological fact in the, hum in the, the animal world. We see animals with all sorts of pairings and not just duos, not just monogamous duos. We see uh, multiple partner pairings. We see um, serial monogamy, which is when, um, when you are paired with a partner, you're monogamous with that partner, with that mating pair. But that person can change from season to season. You know, maybe you spend a couple seasons with this one partner, but then, um, and you're monogamous during that time, but then after a couple seasons, you know, that, that person flies off, male or female or whatever, and um, you get a new one. You know, we see this in birds a lot. Birds are especially promiscuous and uh, especially, and not just promiscuous with a moral con connotation, like humans, that's a bad thing to be promiscuous. But we see sexually aggressive birds and birds that lay their eggs in other people's nests so that other birds uh, bear the burden of raising the young. Uh, we, we see birds, we see eagles that form triads, polyamorous triads or a, a thruple where it's like two dads and one laying breeding female or um, uh, usually you see two males and a female, um, two fertilizers and one uh, egg layer, um, rather than like multiple egg layers and one fertilizer. But we do see that in, in other animals. I mean, it's not unheard of. So, I mean, all these things are just wild and crazy and all over the animal kingdom. And so I really do feel that Lucy would be comfortable with um, the idea that other people's norms and habits and biology might be different from hers and that she shouldn't assume what's right and wrong um, and that she, she really doesn't have the right to dictate to anyone else what their breeding habits or sexual morals or family structure should look like or should be. I mean, you know, if she's sitting in Narnia trying to learn these things, a goose or a swan is going to tell her something wildly different than a cowbird, a brown-headed cowbird. Um, you know, a, a pod of whales or dolphins are going to tell her something completely different from a platypus or, um, or a reptile. There are species of lizards in Arizona, um, and this is one particular article, scientific article that I read once long a time ago. That's why I'm being so specific that 
I read about a species of lizard in Arizona where biologically all, all of the lizards in this subspecies are all uh, what we would call female. XX chromosome uh, egg layers, you know, the egg layers. And all of them are, all of them. And they have this subspecies for whatever reason has developed a basic biology of um, parthenogenesis, a, a form of asexual reproduction. Basically, they clone themselves with some amount of variation to keep the population genetically healthy. They just, they just are all women and they reproduce on their own and keep their species, their subspecies of lizard going that way. That's just how they are. And, um, you know, imagine hearing from, uh, what's a particularly monogamous species? Um, I want to say ducks, but ducks are awful. Don't base anything on ducks. Um, birds in general, birds are wacky. Their morals and family structures are very complicated and different from species to species. Yeah, I'm having trouble right now. <laughs> I'm having trouble thinking of an animal species that is particularly known for its monogamy and maybe lifelong pairing, mating pairing. Um, shoot. <laughs> House cats? Cats are dogs? Well, oh, dogs are pack animals. So it's, you know, it looks similar to what humans do, but it's not exactly the same. Um, but we'll use a dog. We'll use a canine, uh, a wolf, or a domesticated dog, or any of a, a canine breed. So imagine a canine breed telling Lucy how to be an adult, how to reproduce and raise your children. And, um, you know, a, a lizard from Arizona, one of these subspecies of Arizona lizards, um, <laughs> telling her how to be an adult and what to do to reproduce and raise her children. Whackadoodle, right? Whackadoodle. So for me, um, I'm always going to have Lucy if not Lucy and Edmund, uh, be pride flag waving, social injustice fighting, um, just um, fair minded, open, adaptive, and accepting uh, sorts of people because it just wouldn't make sense to be racist or homophobic or xenophobic as a Narnian. It just, it wouldn't make sense. There's all kinds of color fur and all kinds of different species of animal that for them in Narnia were people, not just animals, but recognized as people. They had personhood. So she would have learned that and that would have been core. It would have, that's the core stuff that makes a person a person and recognize personhood in other people. And she would have that. She would have a Narnian sense of that. So this has been extremely long. I'm very sorry, but I'm also kind of not sorry because I'm obviously very passionate about the Narnians in general and particularly about Lucy and Ed and Susan. You've, you've heard I have a rant about Susan. The only one I probably don't really give a flying fig about is Peter. I mean, he's Peter. He's the High King. Gotta respect that. He, um, well, he, he was kind of a Mary Sue. I mean, not not like a C.S. Lewis analog. I think he's on record saying that he feels more like an Edmund. But Peter, you know, he was golden-haired and blue-eyed and rugged, but not too rugged. 
and, um, how my tooth hurts today, you know, and he, you know, he was made high king by virtue of being the oldest male in the family. And he had a sword and in his first sword fight got kind of really, really stinking lucky and, um, so came out victorious by virtue of dumb luck. And is that not just the history of every white Western male in, you know, since the dawn of time? Just dumb freaking luck um, that they then later turn into actual skill and use it to rule everyone all the time. I mean, I'm not... I'm not particularly angry with Peter for being that. I mean, that's what he was born and raised to be, especially in that that era. Um, you know, so it's not like he did anything himself. There was nothing he personally did wrong. Um, it was just taking advantage of systemic privilege and then living up to the expectations. So, you know, way to go, Peter. You were High King, and you eventually earned it. Um, but yeah, you know, your siblings had a lot more they had to go through to become the adults that they became. A lot more had to, had to be done. Anyway, so that's my thing on Lucy. That's, that's kind of my thing on the Narnians and how they were raised and how they grew up and what sort of questions we as people should be asking about them as, as good readers, as reader intelligent readers. We should always be reading our books, our literature, even our newspapers and, and journals. We should always be reading while thinking of questions to ask about what we're reading. And, um, and so that's when I, now as an adult, when I was a kid, I just read it and it was magical. And my mother read it to me and it was genuinely a magical, wonderful experience. You know, very mother-daughter bonding, mother-child bonding, because uh, she read it to me and my siblings at the same time. So, you know, fabulous. But as an adult, you go back and reread things and you got to turn on your critical thinking. You can't just shut it down and zone out. Uh, so, you know, think about it. Think, think about whether Ed would be bisexual. There's the flag. Hey, bye. Stop by eraser. eraser. Um, you know, whether uh, Lucy would be um, just determined to stand up for the rights and fair treatment of others. Things like that. It's great stuff. Thanks for letting me chat with you about that. I, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts and responses either in live chat while I'm live or if you are watching this recorded uh, in the comments below. I'd love to hear what, what you think and how you interpreted things and what you think these things mean and all that.